malaria. In all languages, it means the world's worst illness. It kills about a million children each year in Africa. It hinders social and economic progress in the least developed parts of the world. What is malaria? It is caused by single-celled creatures, parasites, called plasmodium. And they live through several stages of their development in the blood of man. Plasmodium move towards and then into the liver cells. Most of them, in a week or two, multiply 10,000 times. They travel in the blood all over the body, where they penetrate our red blood cells. They again multiply. As they break out of the red blood cells, the victim may feel very cold. This is followed by a fever. This happens again and again, every few days. The parasites find new red cells and multiply yet again. The victims weaken with each attack. Sometimes they die. Sometimes they recover. Some are left so weak that they die of other illnesses. People cannot pass on malaria directly to one another, except accidentally through a blood transfusion. It is the mosquito that carries it. We now know a great deal about the life of the mosquito. There are some 2,000 different species, but only about 60 of them can carry malaria. All of them lay eggs so small that they're difficult to see. They're laid on or near the edge of water. The eggs are free of plasmodium. Some will become female mosquitoes able to carry the parasites. Other species are quite harmless as far as malaria is concerned. The eggs hatch into larvae. Most species like fresh water. But some will develop in dirty water and others even in salt water. The larvae become pupae. These hatch into mosquitoes there will be about the same number of males as females. Males feed on nectar and are no direct danger to man. The females also feed on nectar, but to develop their eggs, they need meals of blood. They have the power to pierce skin to find a small blood vessel. They first inject their own saliva. This makes the blood easier to suck. If there is plasmodium in the victim, this will be taken up with the blood into the mosquito's stomach. In the stomach of some species of mosquito, male and female cells of plasmodium unite and in a few days multiply by hundreds and thousands. This new generation of parasites make their way to the salivary glands. Here they wait until the mosquito next bites. Now, when the saliva is pumped down, there is a vast invasion of plasmodium. All mosquitoes are born without plasmodium. So young females are harmless when they first bite. They will not become malaria carriers when they bite people who don't have plasmodium in their blood. But as soon as they bite someone with plasmodium in their blood, 
After a week or ten days, that mosquito begins to pass on malaria to other people. How can we stop it happening? We can kill plasmodium by giving people drugs. But unless we cure everyone, and at the same time, the mosquitoes will spread it all over again. We can kill some mosquitoes, but can we kill enough to be effective? The answer for the future will come from more research. The answer now is to attack the chain at the weakest link. These are the areas of the world where the population once suffered from malaria. With higher standards of living, malaria was reduced. With the use of DDT, whole regions were cleared. It seemed as if the battle could be won. Then, in some areas, the mosquitoes developed resistance to DDT and malaria advanced again. Both insects and plasmodium have been on the earth longer than man. They produce many generations in a short time, adapting very quickly to their environment, which enables them to survive and multiply. We're trying to find out how they adapt. Different species have different habits, can survive different conditions, are resistant to different chemicals. We now know that there are four kinds of plasmodium that can live in man. They can all be killed by drugs. By using the knowledge we have and sharing the responsibilities for health care, we can prevent people from suffering and dying from this disease. To fight it, we have to make changes in the way we live. In this part of Africa, Irrigation has changed desert into fertile plain. Hundreds of thousands of families have come to live and work here. Near the villages, the irrigation canals, the ditches and where they overflow are a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Millions of them breed here. And one species is a malaria carrier. The illness here weakens the people and the economy. In this ward, two children to each bed. The hospitals do not have the resources to cope with so many cases. Few know what has made them ill, and they have no idea how to help themselves or their children. But this is about to change. The Blue Nile Health Project has grown out of 20 years of experiments in malaria control, in farming methods, and in studying the way people live. The experts decide how best they can respond to local conditions and find a way of controlling the disease with the money that is available, which may be very, very little. The need is for self-help, and the key is education. People need to understand how they catch the disease, the part they need to play in breaking the cycle of contact between mosquito, man and plasmodium. Can their action break the vicious circle? Lectures and film shows are held in the villages and the whole community is encouraged to attend. The village committee is involved and gives its support. The village committee and the teachers become part of the information team so that when people feel unwell, they know why they should go to the new clinics. They will be asked to give a blood sample if there is a microscope available. Although it is the certain way to find out whether the patient has malaria, treatment can still be given in the simplest clinics as long as the right drugs are there. All the time, the behavior of the mosquitoes is assessed. Are they changing their habits? Here they discovered that the malaria-carrying species only breeds in slow running and still water. So now they control the flow in the irrigation channels. 
making sure the water does not stay still long enough for the larvae to hatch. Regular weeding keeps the ditches clear. But a cheaper, long-term solution may be fish. Grass carp eat enormous amounts of weed and are now being placed in the main canals. But the most important factor is the way people live. They're encouraged to protect themselves, putting gauze at their windows to keep out mosquitoes, burning smoke coils to drive mosquitoes away. The malaria mosquitoes only bite at night, so using a mosquito net when sleeping out of doors is important. When people know about malaria, they know what they're fighting and can better decide how to spend their hard-earned money. Hopefully, they will choose good health. This is all going on in a small study area and the intention is to expand the scheme to include 2,000 villages. But will enough money and people with the right training be available to do it? The control of malaria in cities is a different problem. India, 75 years ago, In one area of Bombay, 50% of the children had plasmodium in their blood. Today, there is only one case of malaria each year for several thousand people. A great achievement, because Bombay is a city where rich and poor live side by side. Every day, 300 new families arrive to swell the population. Some will certainly be malaria carriers. It is a city where malaria-carrying mosquitoes breed in any fresh water that's left exposed to them. They have to be controlled. To do this, there is a pest control officer for each of the nine wards in the city. He is a science graduate with a special training in entomology. Each pest control officer works with a dozen junior overseers. The overseers are qualified sanitary inspectors and it is their job to check every potential mosquito breeding place. No, there's nothing here. Yes, sir. When did you get the breeding last time? Two, three months back I got once. Yeah. And, there and are since then you have been treating with? Yeah. Bombay has a quarter of a million water tanks. The aim is to keep every one mosquito proof. inspected regularly to make sure that they're up to standard and that they're effectively secured. Water tanks on new buildings cannot be permanently connected to the water mains unless they have secure covers and ladders to allow easy inspection. Even so, some are badly designed or neglected and even a tiny hole allows the mosquitoes to get in and breed. Public health authorities take such deficiencies very seriously. And if the owners of such tanks do not repair them, they are prosecuted and fined. However, with new buildings, it is impossible to prevent puddles and larger areas of water forming. This is particularly bad in the rainy season. Water lying in basements has to be treated with oil to poison the larvae. But open wells cannot be poisoned with oil. So here, small fish that feed on the mosquito larvae are used, a neat form of biological control. Unoccupied buildings with flooded basements provide a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Here again, fish are used to control the numbers of larvae.
Elsewhere, the larvae are poisoned. Some breeding is nevertheless inevitable. There are clinics all over the city to give immediate treatment for all patients with fever. As few people here have had the disease, there is little resistance to it. So without care, an epidemic could easily start. Blood samples are taken and either examined on the spot or sent to a central laboratory. The slides are stained so that plasmodium can be identified and an accurate diagnosis made. The work of all the sections in the public health department is coordinated so that day-to-day -day adjustments can be made and long-term planning revised. So we requested our engineers to see that they are also certified like any other time. The particular species of mosquito that live in the Bombay area are constantly studied. But the public health department cannot hope to succeed alone. So part of the job is training others. Explaining to engineers, architects and plumbers the need for effective design and installation to control the mosquito. When they understand the risks and the reasons, they too will support and extend the work of the municipality. There is nowhere in the world where the control of malaria is ever easy. Thailand started to tackle its problem 50 years ago, when there was malaria over the whole country. 35 years ago, one person in four had the disease. 10 years ago, it had been reduced to only one in every 400. But today, some mosquitoes are not being controlled by common insecticides. And some strains of plasmodium have become more difficult to treat with drugs. So in some places, malaria is on the increase again, and the plan for control needs to be adapted to each part of the country. The ease and speed of travel makes the problem worse. The towns are free of malaria, but all the time roads are being upgraded and transport improved, so infected people in one rural area can quickly carry the infection to people living in another rural area. It is villages in the newly cleared forests that are now the source of malaria. Cutting wood, growing food and the increasing population mean that people are pushing deeper into the jungle. It's here that people with plasmodium in their blood bring malaria to uninfected mosquitoes and the vicious circle starts again. There is no way to stop insects breeding in these remote areas. One malaria-carrying species favours running water. Another favours standing water. Some groups of people present special problems, like gem miners seeking their fortunes in remote places. They live roughly and are exposed to infection. They travel to sell their treasure, carrying with them the unwanted gift of malaria. <laughs> Mechanised gem mining. Large puddles are left behind, which then become breeding grounds for malaria mosquitoes. Rubber tappers, too, are very much at risk. They work outdoors at night, just when the mosquitoes are searching for their meal of blood. So, the malaria situation in Thailand is complex. Within the Public Health Service, there are some 20 sections for research and training and the coordination of malaria control. This involves over 300 sector offices and clinics. The clinics are manned by fully trained people qualified to take blood samples, identify plasmodium and give treatment. Villagers who suspect that they or their children have malaria attend the clinics and they don't have to pay for diagnosis and treatment. 
But in some areas where villages are far apart, one clinic for the sector is not enough. So the Ministry of Public Health has encouraged communities to help themselves. <coughs> Volunteers are being trained to take blood samples and make slides. The volunteers' homes then become clinics too, where patients can get help and treatment. The volunteers' slides are collected by a house visitor. Motorbikes are part paid for by the government and part by the workers. The slides are returned to the sector or zone office for examination. Any patients proved to have malaria can then be treated with specific anti-malaria drugs. House visitors also go regularly to every dwelling in all the villages in their sector to find out whether there's been any illness or fever. A careful record is kept. The information from clinics, volunteers and house visitors is fed back into the organisation. Careful recording and analysis of this information enables those responsible to control the disease by pinpointing particular problems, comparing the number of cases this month with the same month last year. These flags mark where patients with a very dangerous form of plasmodium were found. They were scattered without any apparent connection over several regions. It was vital to find the source of this resistant infection before it spread further. Eventually, it was tracked down to people travelling on a bus that ran twice a week from the Kampuchean border. The malaria workers could not make the bus come to their clinic. So, with the cooperation of the police and the bus company, they set up their clinic at the roadside. They explained the situation, gave passengers food and drink while they sought their cooperation. Some of them were gem miners and their families returning home. And it was these people who were carrying the infection. There were some protests, but eventually all were persuaded to give blood samples and were themselves given anti-malaria drugs as a precaution. The bus was stopped regularly from then on. Wise use of information and a practical approach had controlled this serious outbreak of malaria. Such effective work depends on the good organisation of well-trained staff. All the clinic and sector workers attend courses to learn to use a microscope. They're taught the principles of management and organisation. They need to know what to do, how to do it, and how to get cooperation. Choosing the right kind of people for the job is vital. They must be able to explain to the villagers and persuade them to allow the spraying of their homes. Sometimes there is resistance. The spray men must be patient to gain acceptance by the people. Some have spent many days in one community trying to win confidence and trust using every opportunity, finally gaining the villagers' agreement. The next stage is to train local people as spraymen so that the villagers can begin to look after themselves. And the quality of the work of local people is constantly checked so that they continue to use the minimum quantities of insecticide that will be effective and safe. Entomologists travel all over the country, studying how effective the control measures have been. They are welcomed to use the places that are best for their work. New strategy will be based on this research. The rubber tappers, for example, have found that by burning smoke coils in tins round their waists, they can keep mosquitoes away. 
plasmodium's resistance to drugs has to be monitored clinically all the time. In this laboratory, one strain of malaria carriers is being mated and specially reared for further research. The World Health Organization's Malaria Action Programme exists to coordinate all knowledge and research and use it to strengthen efforts in every country. To make use of this support, each country needs to have the political will, well-trained staff and the economic means to keep people healthy. Thanks to the efforts of the Thailand health workers, this village has started to take care of its own malaria problem. This is an important ceremony because until today, these people had no clinic. They worked together to collect the money to build it and from now on, two of their volunteers will staff it each day. Through their own efforts and support from the Ministry of Public Health, these villagers are fighting the battle against malaria in the way it needs to be fought in rural areas all over the world.